Welcome, everyone, to this very special Google Hangout on uh, women and entrepreneurship. Uh, I have two very special guests with us today, uh, Rana El Kalyubi and uh, Bridget Bean. Um, I'll start with a short introduction on uh, Rana, Chief Science Officer and Co-Founder of Affectiva, an MIT startup uh, that is bringing emotion awareness into our digital experiences and devices. Uh, so before starting Affectiva, she was a research scientist at the MIT Media Lab, uh, and she has been recently named by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the seven most powerful women to watch in 2014. So we started the year actually watching her. Um, Rana is Egyptian, uh, so she's from the Middle East. She grew up between Egypt, Kuwait, and uh, the Emirates. Uh, she studied at the American University of Cairo, and she holds a PhD from Cambridge University. Uh, and she's very proud of her two kids, uh, Jana, who's 10, and uh, Adam, who's 5. Um, so I will let uh, Rana start the discussion. And um, then we'll move to Bridget, and then we'll have a session of uh, Q&A. Rana, we're all ears. <laughs> Thank you, Hela. Um, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll just maybe uh, start by sharing um, some of my story about how I got to where I am at. And, and hopefully that will you know, spark some good dialogue and questions. Um, so as Hela said, I am Egyptian. I grew up in Kuwait and Abu Dhabi and ended up studying computer science at the American University in Cairo for my undergraduate and master's degree. And, and really, as an undergraduate in computer science and having spent so much time in front of my computer, like a lot of us, I began to question why our devices um, don't, you know, don't interact with us the same way we interact with each other. And I started imagining a world where our computers can be emotion aware. Emotions are very important in our lives. and. Um, they drive everything we do from, especially, I think this, you know, Arabs will resonate with that. We're very emotional and we're very passionate people and, and a very passionate culture. And so much time with our technology, technology should be emotion aware and should be emotionally intelligent. So I started dreaming of this um, computer that would read your facial expressions and react to, you know, react to your emotions in real time. Did that for my PhD. Um, and started to explore applications of this technology as I joined MIT as a research scientist. And our first stop, you know, I always thought I would be an academic and I would end up being a professor at some university. That was the plan. And at MIT Media Lab in particular, we get a lot of sponsors. Google is actually one of our biggest sponsors of the lab. And um, when I joined, I was focusing on one specific application of the technology, which is helping autistic kids, and I, you know, I still feel very strongly about that. Um, but a lot of our commercial sponsors kept saying, you know, this technology is really interesting. You should, um, you should consider starting a company. And I'd say, you know, no, 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 you know, not interested, not interested. Until, um, I, you know, I spoke to our uh, media lab director, Frank Moss, and he really, you know, encouraged us to spin out. Um, into a company to try and make this ubiquitous, to really try and change how people do things. And that, I don't know, that turned a switch in me and I kind of became, you know, I really wanted um, to bring this technology out to the world as opposed to just, a, you know, a limited research project. Um, so that was four years ago. We started Affectiva. It's, um, it's been an amazing learning experience. We've raised three rounds of funding. Um, one of our investors, or actually a few of our investors, are top-tier investors like Kleiner Perkins, who also invested in you know all the big kind of um, um, companies um, that we know of. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I'd still say we're at the beginning of our journey. We're a, we're a thirty-person startup um, based in Waltham, which is like fifteen minutes outside of Boston, in Massachusetts, and we do. You know, we have global partners around the world. Um, so we're, we're working really hard to, to get the technology out there. We've still got a lot of work to do, but it's, uh, it's been an exciting journey. Yeah, I know one of the questions that Hela wanted me to speak about was uh, more around my experience as a, as a young Egyptian Arab entrepreneur who's in the high-tech industry. Um, 
I, I have to say that, like, even as a student, as a PhD student at Cambridge University, I was in the computer science department there, and there must have been, like, less than 10 women out of, like, hundreds of other PhD students at the lab. And I think it's a double-edged sword. It's definitely challenging because you have, you know, there's a smaller network of, of, of common, you know, like, females um, to connect with, but at the same time, it's easier to stand out. And I think, I think I found that, you know, at every stop along the way, even as a, you know, as a business, you know, as an entrepreneur who's coming from a high-tech industry and trying to start a company, as we pitched to different investors on both the East Coast and the West Coast, I felt like we always stood out because, because you know, of this kind of woman factor. And, and so I, I feel like even though there's definitely less role models, there's more, but, you know, you know compared to men, there's, there's less of us. I think um, it, it actually makes it, you know, you can stand out. You can make a difference. Do you wanted to ask about the dress code uh, of the women uh, entrepreneurs in the Arab region. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Um, yeah, I think when I... When I first started kind of, you know, like four years ago, and we were doing a lot of, you know, pitching to uh, venture capitalists and a lot of meetings with potential business partners, um, I always dressed in like a suit, and it was always like either a black or gray or navy blue suit, and um, I, I think I really was working very hard to fit, you know, to look like every other guy that they saw. Um, but I feel like as I gained more confidence, um, I started... I think just being more comfortable just being me. And so um, I found this niche of, of, of a dress code that works for me, which is a combination of professional but also hip and funky. <laughs> and um, and I, I think, again, that, you know, that helps you stand out. I, I think the main message is that you really need to be confident that you, because, because you're a woman, you bring something different to the table, whether it's in how you look, or whether it's your ideas, it's, or whether even it's like your management and leadership style. I definitely think I have a different kind of leadership style, and I, I, I feel like I've become more comfortable and confident um, with that style. So, uh, Bridget, um, so uh, can you can you answer this question, please? Yeah, for sure. I think something that's quite interesting is at Google, uh, there really isn't a dress code. So you will see a lot of top top executives walking around in jeans, t-shirts, bike outfits, like they just got off of a bicycle. Um, so in some ways, there's almost a pressure and a, a, a thought around being very, very casual, right? And that you actually shouldn't, I mean, you don't need to actually try to dress up. You don't have to wear a dress. You don't have to really do anything. Um, but I do think being comfortable and feeling confident in yourself is really important. And wearing clothes and, and wearing the things that make you feel that way are really important. So I tend to dress up. I'm younger. And often I end up in situations with a lot of, um, a lot of top leadership. And I don't know if it makes an impact. But for me, I feel more comfortable being dressed up despite the fact that I don't have to. So I think a lot of it just goes with you know, still being yourself, still like putting on things that make you feel confident, um, I think that's really important. And again, like, I mean, I usually wear a lot of funky jewelry and um, lots of fun scarves and things, which I think, you know, it for me bring out a lot of personality. But um, I think, you know, it's really about feeling comfortable and confident. Well, it's uh, regarding, it's a quote from uh, Cheryl uh, uh, Sandberg's book. So uh, the quote is, the time is long overdue to encourage more women to dream the possible dream. So uh, can you a little bit uh, uh, tell us where we stand, uh, we stand on this in the Arab region? Yeah, I, 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 I feel like the time is right um, for more women to really pursue whatever they're passionate about. Um, when I... When I first started, my own parents um, were pretty opposed to the idea of me going off and, and, and doing my PhD, and they were like, you know, maybe you just fo you know just focus on your, you know, on your husband and, and 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 family, and just forget about those dreams. And I, 
and, and to my husband's credit, he actually really encouraged me to um, to apply for a PhD and, and, and you know, go abroad and basically study abroad um, at an academic problem a program that I'm really excited about. The same thing happened when I was starting Affectiva. A lot of people said, oh, you know, you're a scientist. Just, you know, just do your science. Don't, you know, you won't be able to start a company. Nobody will ever fund you. Like, you get all these naysayers who... Um, who just really make it, you know, seem like it's impossible. And I think what really helped me was a group of, you know, a small group of supporters who really believed in what we're trying to do and really believed in me as a person and just said, you know, like, keep going. And I think it's this group of mentors and supporters um, that, that really helped me. And my advice to young women is to find, you know, a handful. It doesn't have to be hundreds. Just a few people who really believe in you um, and stay close to them, right? And ignore all the naysayers because you're going to run into a lot of them. There's a lot of people who are just very risk averse and who, who will just make it sound like it's not doable. And, and I also do something that you really care about. Like, you have to be really passionate about your cause so that every time a person says, oh, you can't do it, you're just like, you care so much about this cause that you're like, you know what, I think I can, and you just keep going. So. Yeah, um, my team has focused a lot on how we can support women, women entrepreneurs. My team's Google for Entrepreneurs. Um, and a lot of the research has shown that women are actually starting companies at one and a half times the rate of men. So they're actually starting companies. We as a group are starting companies quite frequently, but we're growing slower. Um, and I think it goes to a lot of women taking that extra risk, right? So oftentimes women don't go out to try to raise capital as frequently as men. Um, they often don't try to grow their business. They, you know, sometimes it's a lifestyle business, but many times I think there's a little bit of that fear that keeps them from pushing forward and trying to accomplish something larger. Um, and I think that that's where creating this strong network of mentors really comes into play. People who are able to share your vision with you and push you towards a larger goal. And I think setting big goals in the beginning is important. And knowing what you're in it for. If you're in it for a lifestyle business and you want to have an independent, um, solely owned business and really have a few employees or even just yourself, that's fine. I think that's, a, I mean, it's a wonderful ambition. But if you really want to grow big, taking that extra leap is incredibly important. Um, they say that women actually operate businesses, so similar businesses to men, on one-third less capital, but they actually produce 12% higher returns. So women are super capable. The research says that women are super capable of actually providing a really efficient and amazing operation and doing it well, even on less resources. But I think it's important that we all, if we want to have that vision and want to have that goal, go forward and actually ask for those resources. And I think in many ways that's what Cheryl's talking about in her book is to lean in, like say, no, I actually want to be a part of this community and I really want to raise money to have a big company, to really grow. Okay, so Bridget, I'm going to ask you one question uh, regarding the female angel investors. So uh, where we can find them? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that a lot of them are actually within the uh, existing male, um, you know, kind of male-dominated angel groups. There are some uh, growing number of people who are putting together, women who are putting together investment funds. I think you guys have probably seen some of the news on that. Um, and there's a lot more focus on accelerator programs and other programs getting women into their cohort. Uh, there's a lot of research around this too. I think this is quite interesting that, you know, the average successful woman entrepreneur is in their 30s, and late 30s. This is the same as for men. And often women at that age, in that time, um, have more commitments, right, than their male counterparts. They have more, like, life complication. So I think in terms of investors, if you can find a woman investor who understands you and looks, and looks like you, um, you'll probably have a better chance of sort of getting that mentorship from them and having an understanding ear. But that's what I think that there's a big push, even with our, the male VCs and the male angel groups, to also really invest in women. And I hear from a lot of VCs, how can you help me find great female entrepreneurs to invest in? Because they know that they make great founders. Anna, also, uh, I will address you the same question, please. 
Yeah, yeah. When, so when we were looking for investors, I think I think our biggest criteria was whether they share our values or not, because so it, investors are almost like a, you know, like almost like getting married, because you're going to be spending many, many years with them, you know, interacting very closely, building this great thing, right? And so it's really important that you click at a values level, and share and share kind of share a vision for where this company could go. So that was our main criteria, and I, I feel like we're very fortunate in, in that we, you know, in in finding investors that share our values for trying to improve people's lives and trying to change the way people connect and communicate with each other, um, and, and that they're you know that they're not in it for the for it's not they don't want to flip this you know this company or this technology in a few years they really want to build something um, you know great um, so I thought I thought that was an important criteria and you know what we didn't shy away from talking to. Um, you know, it's the big players. Um, to Bridget's point, you just, you know, we leaned in. We, we, we just, you know, we took the opportunity to connect with um, everybody we could get our hands on. As a woman, as a woman entrepreneur, uh, do you think you got the uh, the the good support uh, uh, in your business? I I would say we definitely got a lot of support, especially MIT is a great environment in that they really help help, you know, technologists kind of transfer their company and spin out spin out technology out of MIT. So I think we got a lot of support. I would say that it's easier for people to pigeonhole you. So, you know, even though I've been at this for four years, um, I still think I get pigeonholed as the scientist, less so as the kind of as, a, as the business person or as a person who, contrib who can contribute on, on the business development side of things. And so I... I, I feel like that's a continuous struggle that I have to that I have to grapple with, um, but it's also a learning opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to um, um, to to go back to the, the book of the year, if you want a bit, uh, which is uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book. Um, that I have to say has been quite a revelation for me because it's everything that I thought actually put into words. I don't know if you felt the same. Uh, I mean, she sold 100,050 copies of the book in just one week, um, and it's been the bestseller nonfiction book since then. Um, and there's one sentence that had a great impact on me. Um, a one trails of women as competent professionals and happy mothers, or even happy professionals. What do you think of that? I know we've been discussing this a bit, Rana. Um, how do you feel about this quote? Yeah, so um, I feel very passionate about this quote. So I, I have two kids, um, Jenna, who's 10, and Adam, who's 5, and I really like to believe that I can be both a very competent professional and a very competent mom, but more importantly, a very passionate, you know, loving mother and a very passionate professional too and so I, I try to it, it's it's definitely hard to strike a balance for sure because because I'm extremely passionate about affective and it's always at the back of my mind um, but I think you can be both and in fact I like to believe that because I'm a competent professional and a, you know I love what I do I, I'm hoping that this sets a good role model for my children especially my daughter I'm hoping that she's you know she's growing up seeing her mom working really hard, loving what she does, but at the same time really invested in her children's welfare and, and, and their future. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that that's kind of being ingrained subconsciously maybe in her, <laughs> in her mind. I just bit a bit on, on what you've told us, uh, you know, the fact that being a woman was more memorable and um, and she also, Sandy, uh, I mean, Sherry Sandberg said also, when you come to work, uh, come as your whole self, not just the professional woman, but also the mother and the emotional woman. So since your work is around emotions, do you see the emotional part of women as being a, a strength or a weakness? I, a think, I, I think it's a strength. Actually, um, 
I, I don't, I, I bring my emotions to work, absolutely, and so sometimes I'll get very, in, you know, very gen, you know, energetic and passionate about a certain topic, and I'll argue to death about it, and sometimes I actually, I'm so, you know, I'm so moved that I'll cry, you know, and I, I don't shy away from that, because I think, I think it builds trust, when, when you bring your true self to work, it builds trust, and it shows a, a vulnerability that then makes it easier for people to open up to, right? And so I feel like, um, you know, pe I'm, people, I'm people's confidants. They'll come to me and they'll share with me stuff that they maybe wouldn't share otherwise. And that's because I do the same too. And so um, I like to believe that it's a strength, but um, I don't know if everybody will agree. Yeah, so Bridget, how do you feel about this? Do you, yeah. do you cry? <laughs> Um, I think that it's it's a benefit overall, but I think just like any emotion, you have to have some control and self-awareness, right? And this is true if you're a man or a woman, right? It doesn't matter. Um, I think that there's one huge benefit that I find in the business world is that women tend to have a lot less ego and are much more approachable. So I have conversations with people that I think many of the male counterparts in my industry don't have. Um, I have a lot of personal conversations with people. I bring my whole self to work. They know about my family, you know, my husband, our plans, our house, what we're doing. We have like really great connections and I think that is something that goes a very long way in business and it goes a very long way in building meaningful relationships in your whole life, which I think makes women more happy. It makes me more happy in the workplace to have meaningful relationships. Um, and also I think in many ways people you know, they, they have an openness with you that they may not have with others if you, and that's, that's, um, can be brought out if you're willing to be open with them. And I think that, in many ways, is a more feminine trait. Um, so I think, in overall, it's, it's a huge benefit, and I, I'm better at my job, I believe, because I'm a woman, but it also requires me, at the same point, to be aware that maybe crying in every meeting would be a bad idea, <laughs> or, you know, where there's, where the opportunities, um, makes sense to, you know, be assertive and maybe in some ways take on what people would say more male traits, but I think just like Cheryl said, you know, leaning in is something that women need to do, so, you know, balancing the two of those, but in a, in a net way, I think it's a benefit to my job. I can't imagine trying to do the work that I do um, as, as a man, obviously. It would be really tough. I think that I'm, I'm in the best position this way. Well, Bridget, I'm going to Can I add one more uh, one more thing piggybacking on. Yeah, sorry, Rana, go ahead. I'll ask my question to Bridget afterwards. Yeah, I was uh, inspired by something that Bridget said um, that was actually in Sandy's book, and and I've been using that every day. So, you know, how, like you walk into a room, and most men, like you know, they keep a straight, you know, you know, kind of. I don't know what the word is, but you know, a po the, your pose, right? Like even the way you stand and even the way you come across, even the way you sit at a board meeting table um, will project confidence and assertiveness um, versus not. And um, I've become much more mindful about simple things like how I talk, what's my pose, where do I sit at the table, and I've become much more forceful and assertive in that respect. And that's, I think, Sandy's book made me really reflect on that. I think I was doing a lot of subconscious things um, that I wasn't aware of, and I've just become much more mindful. Interesting. So the ego it gaining ground, in fact, a bit. Uh, uh, yeah, no, hopefully not, not having a big ego, but just, just being a little bit more assertive. So I wanted to use uh, Bridget's non-Arab eyes to look into our region and share a statistic with you about the MIT Arab Startup Competition, uh, where if we look at the past six years of operations, or seven years now, uh, among the six top winners, the, the people who actually won the competition, we have two women, so about a third out of six. Um, if we, this statistic is about the same if we look at the finalist, and if we uh, include in the definition uh, 
teams who had women on them, so not necessarily women-led teams, we could go even higher than this third and maybe reach 40%. Uh, so how do you look at this? I mean, from Silicon Valley, looking at the Arab region with all the um, um, maybe uh, misconception about this region, how do you feel about that, Bridget? Yeah, it's interesting. I hosted a hangout with Chris Schroeder a few months back. Um, and we've talked a lot about this. I think the perception from the outsider's perspective is that the Middle East, that there's no women in the startup and tech community. Um, in fact, maybe very extreme that there aren't even women on the streets. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in and out of the Middle East, and I think that that's a story that you guys actually need to tell yourselves. So not waiting for other people to tell that story, but really all of you going out there and like being advocates for your community because actually your numbers of um, the percentage of women in the entrepreneurship space and attending these events and being part of these programs is higher than in the Silicon Valley. And that's something that I think is really astonishing and also worth like praising, worth talking about. Um, and I've seen you know, a lot of efforts in the media. I think Wanda's tried to do some uh, specific efforts around promoting women entrepreneurs. I think many of you guys have as well. And I think this is a huge potential bucket for you guys to really voice and to talk about. And it's something I talk about a lot is, you know, I'll go and visit a startup hub somewhere in the U.S. and they are telling me they just don't know how to get more women in their space. Um, and often I'll tell them, you know, it's not the same everywhere. Even though the numbers aren't 50-50, um, Mina is doing a wonderful job across Middle East of actually helping promote a lot of women. And this is true even in Saudi Arabia, which many people would see as extremely conservative, right? So I think in some ways it's um, it's a story that's not really being told enough and that, you know, I tell it and I would really advocate that all of you become the voices of this community. You know, um, as a woman who has worked hard on myself, and I'm sure all of us did, I've always been reluctant on uh, many women issues. I mean, positive discrimination because you're a woman and, and yet now we're discussing, you know, all this on a hangout, we're talking about, on a, about a book on women, about, I mean, should we be doing all this or should it be, you know, business as usual and just not mention the elephant in the room? I mean, how do you feel about this whole discussion about women in entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think it should be talked about. Um, one of the considerations I, I, keep talk, I keep discussing with all of these accelerator programs and many of the entrepreneurship programs all over the world um, is they should stop asking why women don't show up to their events and start asking why their programs are broken, why they're not serving 50% of the population. And I think that's, like, you got to frame the question differently and ask a different question, right? And I think it's almost, um, it's almost like that, the concept of, if, if no one ever points out to you that this is a problem and that there's a way to move forward, you may never see it, right? And I think it's important for us to address, but again, in a positive way. So a lot of the narrative in the past around women, like lack of women in the tech community entrepreneurship have been very negative. And I think that's not the story we want to tell. We want to talk about how amazing women entrepreneurs are and how we're investing in them and helping them grow is a smart investment. It's the right thing to do. Um, I see this in myself. My mom is a woman entrepreneur. She's been an entrepreneur my whole life and done incredibly well uh, with her business. And my husband and I also own a company. And I think being a part of that conversation and being able to say, look, you know, we haven't gotten access to the same resources, but when we do, we thrive. We do incredibly well. And we're not going to complain about that. We're going to do something about it. And I think that's very different. Um, and I look forward to more of this conversation happening. But I think it's also a conversation that has to move beyond just women. Like, we all can't just have this conversation. I think it's important for us to also have this conversation that includes men. Because most of them are scared. They're actually scared to have this, have an open dialogue about it because it's such a hot topic. Um, but I think there's a way to do it. I think there's a way for us to say, hey, we don't, we don't have the answers, but we are willing to work with you on this to make it better, to make a little bit more gender equality. Well, Bridget, there are a lot of men in the audience. I can see them in Tunis, in Dubai, in Jeddah. Uh, thank you for hearing us. We're having a private conversation, but letting you listen into it. 
the definition of success uh, Sheryl Sandberg used in her book is that success is making the best choices we can and accepting them. And the last part, obviously, accepting them is sometimes the toughest as a woman because it means um, once you've made a decision to adjust your life towards that vision and um, um, maybe accepting also the judgment of others. How do you feel about this? I, I think the accepting part is, is hard. Um, it's hard because, you, at least for myself, I'm always thinking, like, what if? Like, what if I did this or what if I did that? And um, so, so there's, there's definitely some aspect or component of that. I don't obsess with other people's judgments, or at least I've, I've gotten a lot better about not worrying about other people's judgments because I think that's actually an MIT, an MIT value. You have to be outside of the, you know, out of the box thinker, out of a box doer, and that's how you create value. If you're, if you're like everybody else, then you're not really, uh, you know, you're not really moving the world forward. You have to be doing something and doing it, you know, something different. So, I've come to accept that, and I've come to accept that that means that a lot of people will be will be like, you know, will be questioning, like, what do you do? You know, what do you do? Why, you know, why do you keep going back and forth between Cairo and Boston? Like, so I get all these questions um, and puzzled looks from people. Another woman with us who, who also gets puzzled looks from, um, from people, she's um, a Jordanian who's uh, actually one of the winners of the uh, MIT Arab Startup Competition from last year, uh, Riham from Gallery Shark. Uh, Riham, are you with us? Um, but I can definitely relate to, the, to those puzzled looks um, and defying, I mean, your, your um, attitude defies a lot of um, uh, conservative views of how a woman should behave. Uh, maybe as Riham is joining, uh, Bridget, we can have your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I get I do a lot of international travel for our team and end up hosting a lot of public officials and also people in the startup community. I think they're often confused um, why maybe I'm in the role that I am or why I look like I look in that position. And I think the best defense mechanism is just to continue to realize that, like, I'm here because I, I've worked hard to be here and having confidence in that versus sort of lean, like leaning to the other side, which is um, being awkward or being aware that, you know, maybe in your movements you're not being perfect, but just in that sense having confidence. Um, in terms of choices, this is incredibly hard, and I think this is a, a thing that you'll struggle with as a man or a woman. Um, I'm based in Atlanta now. I chose to move here because of my husband's business. And, you know, in some ways people thought, oh, this is not going to be a great career move for you because, you know, your team is mainly in California. Um, and we've made adjustments. I go to California frequently. I think that I am as successful here as I would be there, but that doesn't mean I put more effort, right? You're making choices, and I think um, would I give my husband up? No, right? That's something I've I've made a choice that my family is more important than my work, and that's the number one priority. But it doesn't mean that I don't want to be amazing at my job, and I think that that's something you we're always going to have to balance. I think women have more things to balance typically than men. But being okay with the choice is important, but also I think having the right priorities and being okay with your priorities is more important than those individual choices. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if um, uh, during the time I was out of uh, the Hangout, uh, you mentioned the uh, price we, we are uh, uh, doing together this year, Bridget, on uh, the best women entrepreneur out of the MIT Arab Startup Competition. Uh, we've had this for three years now. Uh, I have to say that we don't change at all the selection process for the MIT Arab Startup Competition uh, to choose a woman. So um, it's among the women that made it uh, to the um, to the final. And uh, so thank you so much for your contribution, Bridget. Maybe if you have a few words to explain a bit more um, w why you're supporting this prize. Yeah, for sure. So. Um my team decided that rather than just creating um, sort of new women's networks and new women's organizations, that we would really focus on finding the best-in-class entrepreneurial groups 
and asking them to take extra effort to include women in their programs, right? And to think about how they can change and modify their existing program to fit the other half of the population. Um, we have 40 partners that we're, we have committed to doing this. We're calling it 40 Forward, so it's 40 partners rethinking the gender gap. So we're all working together. This includes Startup Weekend, Startup Grind. Um, WAMDA is also participating, Astro Labs from the region. And then with the MIT group, we're actually super excited because this year we're going to extend an, a specific award to a women-founded team um, as part of the MIT competition. And those team members will have a chance to come to the Silicon Valley um, to meet with a number of Googlers. Hopefully we'll be able to get them uh, access to some additional opportunities with mentors, venture capitalists, and other things. But I really, this goes to the fact of, yes, we can naturally have women participate, but we should invite them as well. We should consider reserving spots for the best women to meet so that we encourage them to show up, to be a part of this community. And I really think that this specific um, initiative is going to be amazing. I'm so excited to meet the winning team. And I think in, in many ways it's going to be probably harder in the Middle East because you have more women to choose from, more great women entrepreneurs than you do other places. And I think that's an incredibly exciting thing for us to talk about um, as we continue to sort of evaluate these teams and to look forward at the winner. So we have with us now Reham from uh, last year's uh, finalist, uh, Gallery Shark. Uh, Reham, if you can share with us a bit your journey as a participant in the uh, MIT Arab Startup Competition. Um, first for Gallery Shark and, and then uh, as a woman. And then uh, while Reham is talking, I'll line up some questions from Twitter from the different sites that are uh, connected today. Okay, thank you, Hala. Hello, everybody. Um, I applied to the MIT competition last year, and I was amongst the 50 semifinalists. And when we started our first day there and we started the hackathon, it was, oh my god, it looks like a tough competition. Everybody was energetic and uh, eager to learn and connect and uh, learn from each other. And uh, it was not easy to, uh, to be even the f uh, among the 10 finalists. And uh, it was all in all good experience, good connections, good for Gallery Shark in more than one way. And as we were announced, uh, the one of the ten finalists, and I said, I have to win. It's not a halas. I went there, I went to the ten, I have to win. And uh, I was very well prepared, and uh, uh, we, we competed aggressively till we had the third place in the competition. Yeah, and uh, as for my experience as uh, Riham, as a woman, uh, in this uh, MIT experience, it was uh, adding a lot to me. Uh, meeting some partners and some men good mentors as well. And uh, it did not stop even there. Uh, the good comeback keeps going on to now that I'm being hosted here in Silicon Valley now. I'm in, uh, uh, in San Francisco, uh, thanks to MIT and to TechWadi to host me here, where I'm getting introduced, introduced to more people, uh, more possible partners, more possible customers, and learn more about the uh, SV experience. I would love to hear what your plans are now. What are your ambitions moving forward? Are you trying to hire, yeah. you grow your company? What's the what's the future look like? Yeah, uh, to, uh, the first two years were just establishing the business. And uh, start my, just to give you a brief about what I do, we are uh, an online image bank that's targeting the Middle Eastern identity that's uh, really uncovered in the international companies, um, uh, counting on my experience in the advertising field as a creative director. Uh, we built good connections with photographers, and now we have good connections as in customers as well. And as I came here, I noticed it's not only in the Arab market. Uh, my possible customers could be here as well. And I'm having some good deals uh, in the flow now with some American customers who are in need for this content. And we are really looking forward to scale up to other markets, uh, as to go to Turkey and then later on to the Far East. And uh, we have to move the company uh, somewhere out to have the headquarters maybe here in Silicon Valley and looking for a good investment, inshallah, in a couple of years to grow to where we want. What, what's been most surprising about your experience in the Silicon Valley so far? Uh, What's really uh, surprising to me is the amount, the amount of people that you can meet and bump into. 
And every day I'm meeting new people, and every day I'm meeting a possible partner, every day I'm meeting a possible customer. Uh, that's really a, a time sin that we can do in the Middle East. Uh, every day, literally every day I'm meeting in events and in single meetings. There's a lot of people out there for my, for God's sake to, to, to have good experience through them. Okay, thank you, Diham. Uh, now I'm uh, going to ask some questions from uh, our entrepreneurs, uh, uh, especially for Rana. We have uh, so many questions from you from Egypt. So I'm going to ask you the first question, Rana. So do you think that uh, you would be the same if you were in Egypt? We actually do have a, we have a small Cairo office. Um, I have to say, like, our experience pretty much matches Reham's. Um, there's just such a, there's a much bigger network, um, both on the East Coast and the West Coast in the U.S., of entrepreneurs, of partners, and people are very open um, to new ideas. Um, I, I, I'd say maybe a little bit more than it, than it is back home, but, you know, um, I think that's changing. I think there's a lot. You know, with um, with Lambda and um, the the new kind of incubator space in, at the American University in, in Cairo, at the Greek campus, I think there's um, there's a lot more coalition around new startups. And uh, uh, the, the uh, another question to Rana. So, uh, what do you think about the women entrepreneurship in uh, in uh, Egypt? Again, I'd say it's growing. Like, um, there's clear, you know, I, I know a number of, of women led, you know, or women founded companies back home, and we, you know, we try to stay close um, together. But I think there's an opportunity to create more of a group. So I'm, I'm part of a entrepreneurship group in Boston of women entrepreneurs, and we actually had a meetup yesterday, and it's just fantastic. It's so energizing to be part of this group and. Women who share similar experiences, who share, you know, their key learnings and their challenges, and, and I think it's good to be part of that network. So I look forward to both contributing and supporting similar networks back home. Okay, thank you, Rana. A question to uh, Bridget now. So, uh, Bridget, do you think that startups should uh, seek for investors from VCs or investors outside their countries? Yeah, um, I think Rania actually hit on this much better earlier, which is talking about finding investors that align with your strategic priorities and who are going to help you get to where you want to go. Um, I think money is not as valuable as connections, really, and I think that's something that we're you know, well learned along the way. And finding a VC that really has those connections in that network and wants to see you succeed and wants to help you advance. A lot of um, a lot of VCs these days are working hard to provide design, design ideas and mentoring and networks and classes and really trying to add more value. Um, you'll find that you know, money is not as hard, as, as hard to get as a great network. And I think that's something to always remember. So regardless, if you're trying to build a global company, it'd be worth looking for investors that have a global network. Those investors could be sitting in MENA in the Middle East, or they could be sitting somewhere else. Um, so I think in many ways, I always think about whoever you work investment, they're going to take some stake, some equity in your company. And you want them to be incredibly bought in to your vision and in many ways be a partner for you. Right? They're almost becoming like a part of your founding team. So regardless of where you get the funds, just consider that you really want, if you want to work with this person, if you want to have a meaningful relationship with them and, and almost see them as part of your actual team, um, then it's worth potentially looking at investment from them. I think entrepreneurs are way too uh, happy and sort of focused on the, on the check when really that's actually not the biggest value. One last question and it's going to be to, uh, to Rana. So uh, how do you go about finding your co-founder co and how did you decide to focus on the technology versus being a CEO? Yeah, great question. So um, I started, I co-founded Affectiva with an MIT professor called Rosalind Picard, who really inspired my own research. Um, so it's been great to be part of that journey with her. When when both of us started, we're both, you know, we both have a science and technology background um, and not a lot of business experience. So we decided very early on that we wanted this thing to be great and we wanted this to be a proper company. 
so we went out and hired, um, a, you know, a, a business savvy CEO. We didn't we didn't pretend that we were going to be that person. We in fact complemented our skills by hiring a really competent CEO who then hired an amazing senior team. You know, our VP of Sales and our VP of Product and a lot of people who complement our skills and our strengths. And I think that's really important. Like for for teams who are just starting out, don't shy away from hiring the best people who can complement your skills. Don't pretend you can do it all. One of the most exciting things about starting a company is growing a team. Okay, so I want to thank uh, Rana, Bridget, and Jiham uh, for the Google Hangout. And I would like uh, to take this opportunity to thank uh, Google for Entrepreneurs uh, for the continuous support. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for for the host, and uh, hopefully we'll meet uh, in uh, other uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. Have a wonderful thank evening. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you from Dubai.